So 64, that's not very old. You know, there's a lot of stuff we would never even think of as being historic that fits in that. And some things are no-brainers, homesteads. And when you find old homesteads, they're pretty obvious. You have trash dumps of old cans and other stuff, chunks of concrete. Sometimes you get wall alignments um, all the way up to, to whole buildings and stuff. Um, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with Oak Creek Canyon, if you know all the nooks and crannies or not. But like Mayhew Lodge, no one's going to miss Mayhew Lodge. Even though it's burned down, the walls are still standing. Where it gets less obvious is places that were lived at for a shorter amount of time. And so cabins, roads, camps. Um, there were a number of, of caves and alcoves that were lived in by various homesteaders over time in Oak Creek Canyon. Um, Purdyman lived in a caves, had a had a major campus headquarters was set up in a cave while building um, the road through Creek Canyon, they realigned it. So there's a lot of sites that don't have a lot of obvious signs but are actually very important. The other piece of that is Apache sites. Um, because Apaches live so light on the land, literally days after they leave a site, it's almost impossible to recognize an Apache site. They didn't use a lot of pottery. Um, they take what they had with them. They used a lot of baskets and made wiki-ups, things that degrade naturally. And so at Apache sites, sometimes we're lucky if we get a couple of can lids, some pieces of wire, and maybe one or two artifacts that really let us know, hey, this is, this is an Apache site. Um, so that's, that's where we get into the caution. I'm not worried about you guys here. You're going to know when you're hitting big trash dumps and stuff like that. It's the isolated stuff that I think is going to cause you confusion. Next slide. Um, the other weird thing about trash dumps that's going to be tough to figure out in the field is they have artifacts with a mix of ages. Um, and this could be because it was used over and over. You know, popular camp spots could have been camped in in the 1890s and every few years after that until we closed camping in the canyon. And so you could have stuff from the 1800s, early 1900s, the mid-1900s, and it's all mixed up in one spot because people go back and do the same things at the same places. People pick places for the same reasons. Um, the other thing is people, uh, what we call curate items. And if you think about your grandmother's house, there's probably stuff in, her grandma, in your grandparents' house that's over 100 years old. And so if everyone walked away and just let that collapse as an archaeological site and an archaeologist went into it, they would find stuff from today and they would find stuff from 100 years ago. And so it can be kind of tough. Um, and so about all you can say for sure is that a site can't be any older than the earliest artifact. So if you find a site with a, with a bunch of glass and cans that you can date to the late 30s and early 40s, and then there's a 1918 penny. You know that that site can't be any earlier than 1918 because that's the earliest artifact you have. But that doesn't mean it's from 1918. Probably you have a 1942 trash dump with a bunch of stuff that was only a couple years old and then somebody dropped a much older penny. Um, and so that that's kind of tough. But generally, what you want to look at is, is what is most of the trash. So um, I would ask that you be conservative. If you, if you have doubt, leave the stuff there. But if you find a trash dump, and it's mostly 1970s trash, and then you've got a couple cans from the 60s or from the 50s, that's probably stuff that was in the bed of the truck when they threw all the other trash out of their truck. And it's actually from the 70s. Mm. So that's fine. You know, if, it, if it's just one or two things in a big group of much more recent trash, take it all. But if you find the opposite, where you find a whole bunch of 1930s cans and then you've got two 1980s beer cans on top of it, probably th somebody threw a couple beer cans on top of a historic site. So um, probably just leave the whole thing, but if you want to grab the 80s beer cans off of it, that's fine. But don't take the rest of the older stuff. Next slide. So how do you figure this out? And this is this is a whole field unto itself. 
you know, archaeologists specialize in either prehistoric or historic archaeology. I tend to focus on the prehistoric, and so um, I have to rely a lot on guides and websites and cheat sheets to date the historic sites. Um, but glass, there's some stuff you can, you can, it can be absolutes, and glass is, can be a good one. Um, mold type, and that, that's talking mainly about the tops of bottles. Um, as top technology progresses, the way people manufacture things changes. And so early on, they have early types of three-piece molds where they, they couldn't just mold a bottle all in one. We didn't have the technology. So they made it in parts, and then they welded it together. And if you find all the different, learn what the seams are and find those, it can tell you like a three-piece mold is older than a two-piece mold and on and on and on. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of this because we could be here for a week learning all the pieces of historic archaeology dating. Um, but just generally giving you an idea of, of, of what's available to you. And then if you have an interest, you can just go crazy with this stuff. I'll hand out some, some stuff that at least has websites that you can use later on. Maker's marks on the bottom of bottles. Uh, they change over time. Companies change their, their marks and their logos so we can date things that way. And the other thing that you hear a lot about is SCA, sun colored amethyst. And that's the purple glass. And what that comes from is uh, when they were first making glass, to make it clear, because glass has a, a natural color to it, the silica has a natural color, they use lead to make the glass come out actually clear. Well, lead's expensive. And so they switched to manganese dioxide was one of the things that they used for a while to make glass clear. What they didn't realize is that manganese dioxide turns purple when exposed to sun, sunlight. Um, isotopes turn it purple. And so if you find purple glass, um, and not blue glass like, like uh, Noxzema bottles, which are still made blue, but the purple kind of glass, you know that that's old. And there's a lot of debate out there about when. Um, most literature will say it was last produced in 1915 or 1918. 1918 is the most common date. But like anything, there's boxes of jars sitting around in warehouses places, and eventually they get sold and used and shipped out. And so sometimes you see a date of 1920, and I've even seen people claim that these things were still being produced as late as 1930 in some small shops. But basically, if you get purple glass, you know that you're in the, that, that glass was made between 1890 and 1918. So you have one artifact that you know is really old. And then you have to use your judgment looking at the rest of the assemblage. You know, is it, is it one old artifact again with a bunch of 1970s junk? Or do you have a whole bunch of old stuff? Next slide. And this is an example of the purple. If it's a blue glass bottle, you can't really see through it. But the purple, and sometimes it's, it's very, very faint. This is a really dark purple. But it's always translucent. You can still see through it. And it's purple, not blue. Next slide. And this is a great website for glass. It's the Society of Historic Archaeologists. And a then BLM employee who now retired spearheaded this. And a whole bunch of archaeologists all through different agencies and all across the West and other parts of the country contributed. And so you can come over here and there's all different kinds of things that talk about dating, the shapes, uh, everything you want to know about glass. Next slide. And this just gives you an example of how complex this gets. This is just one of the pages, um, one, one step in, and you can start to see all the different things. And from the basis, just the, the scars, the frontal scars, can tell you information, even without having a logo or anything on there. Next slide. Uh, cans are probably the thing you're going to encounter most that's historic down there. Um, and so cans, like everything else, change over time. And the church key cans, and those are the ones with the triangular holes like a bottle opener makes. Well, those church key cans. Any beer can that was made to have a church key opening is going to be over 50 years old. So if you find a bunch of these, um, please leave them. This is the from the A1 Brewery around Flag. If anyone's curious, I actually have a little bit of information on this. Um, and then the other 
big thing to key into on Dayton cans is um, when they went to the to the full tab or the pop tops. Next slide. And so there's actually a couple things on, on this page. And this actually is a can collector page. And sometimes these avocationalists can be give great information. Um, the downside is these guys like to go out and metal detect, or even better, they like to find trash dumps and go through and take the cans off the forest. The good ones that they find, and there's a whole trade in this. You'll find a lot of sites like this with stuff posted. Um, and you'll even see them posting trips out onto public land, BLM and forest, to go dig through dumps and take stuff. But they have great information. So the, the 16 ounce tall can with a church key like this um, was first introduced in 54. Um, the first all aluminum can that came to the US was the 11 ounce Primo beer and that was 58. So I used to always say if it's aluminum, it's fine, don't worry about it, take it. And then I learned that actually, we're getting to the point that aluminum cans, we're gonna have to start thinking about whether they actually are historic or not. But you're pretty much safe. If it's an aluminum can, you're probably not gonna have an 11 ounce Primo beer can out there. So if it's aluminum, it's trash. Yes? So if we are to leave these, and then what's to prevent the next guy who doesn't know all this to come along and take them, or who's exploited if we take them? And so if if we leave them, do we report to somebody about where they are, or to come look at them, or find them? Or? Um, yes. If, if you have a GPS, that's the best, because, I mean, the canyon's so overgrown. And GPS doesn't always work well. But relocating these things can, can be tough. So if you have a GPS, that would be the best thing, is if you could just email me a GPS location. But otherwise, uh, um, if you can put it on a map or something like that uh, to pass along, because if you just tell me, I won't remember by the time I get to my office. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, if you find trash dumps or good concentrations, uh, I'd love to know where they're at. Because like I said, we haven't surveyed most of the canyon, and so the sites I have are just ones we've stumbled across or otherwise know about, but I know there's lots and lots of stuff out there that we don't have recorded. Just haven't had the time. And for the Oak Creek ambassadors, the protocol is going to be if you find something that you think hits any of these, not only do you leave it, you take a picture, you take a GPS, get that information, and we'll get it to Travis. <laughs> so the same sort of protocol would be ideal for the Friends of Oak Creek if you have those um, facilities. And you can ask to borrow a GPS if needed as well. So just keep that in mind. But essentially we do, we want to report this to Travis so that he's aware of it and we can get into the site and um, disclose it, kind of tell the story that it has to tell and, and then do the so what, if, if that's relocating or, or something so that it's not prone to losing by the next guy. Great question. But, but that is a problem. I mean, the stuff that stays out there is always subject to that. Mm. But then again, we don't have a museum big enough for all of it. Um, and so it's always a, a balancing act of what's important enough that we need to bring it in versus where are we going to put the stuff. And once you take it off of the site, it's never at the site again. And so archaeologically, it's best to have everything on site. But you don't want stuff to be looted off of it mm -hmm. over time. Because right, what you also want besides the thing, you want the story that it tells. Exactly. Right. Yeah, to an archaeologist, the thing isn't that right. important. Yeah. It's the information. Right. So, um, and I'm I'm trying to kind of focus on things that are that are good markers for you guys. So, 1960, the last cone top can. I'll show you a cone top can. So, anytime you find cone top cans, now we're over 50 years old. So that's going to be one that, that will trigger you to, to leave that stuff. And then two right here. Um, this is kind of interesting to me. I don't haven't confirmed this. Again, this is a, a avocationalist, but I think his information is good. I thought that the ring pole tops appeared before the easy pop tops, but he's saying pop tops in '63 and ring top in '65. Um, but either way, for now, if you find a pop top or a pull tab can, that's over 50. That's trash. You're good to clean that up. Next slide. 